This, this picture is from my website. Um, and as you can tell, I like to, to do uh, CW and portable operation here on my deck uh, when the weather is right, which of course lately we've had a ton of rain. But I'd like to talk tonight about mobile, portable, and out of country and DX. Um, most everybody is, knows that you know you got a two meter rig, you could put that in your car. And um, the nice part about, about two meters is, let me do this as a slideshow here. Sorry, hold on, slideshow. Um, there you go. Um, so you've got power with your car, uh, your HT rigs or your mobile rigs generally don't take more than 10 amps. You know, some of you guys have run more than that, I'm not sure, but uh, then for 20 amps, of course, you, you can run your bigger HF 100 watt rigs off your <laughs> You have to go directly to your battery or um, a power source that hooks up to your battery for 20 amps. Um, for mobile, mobile work, um, it's easy because you mount the antenna on your car. And uh, for 2 meters and 440, it's a very efficient antenna because it's, correct me if I'm wrong, a full wave or half wave? Five eighths. Five eighths, five eighths wave. So yeah, yeah. it's a pretty efficient antenna system for 2 and 440. Um, for 6 meters through 80, uh, you'll see a number of uh, antennas, especially at HamFest, that you're kind of jaw-dropping antennas. It's like, whoa, where, is this guy married or what? Uh, because, <laughs> and as some of you guys were at Berryville last week, uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, if propagation is good, I remember using, remember those little Radio Shack 10-meter uh, Radios, I think they were 25 watts. You could talk, you could talk to the world with a quarter wave stuck on top of your car uh, when propagation was good. So 10 meters was great. Um, as you get up in the band, the antennas are going to be less efficient, but uh, just increase the power and kick your tuner in and hope hope for the best. It's got to go somewhere. Um, some of the popular antennas are ham sticks, which are the most economical ones, and I have bunch of those and I think they're around about 35 bucks now. Now they're called Procom. And they're made for all the different bands. They're monobanders so you have to keep changing every time you want to change uh, frequency. But um, if you're going to operate mobile, generally you're going to stay in one band. Um, some of the popular rigs of the ICOM uh, 740 and the ASU, uh, some of the popular uh, antenna tuners are the ICOM and the Yesu, which are expensive. So I recommend just getting a hamstick if you're going to start out with the new fellows and, uh, and just tune the hamstick and be done with it. They also have something called a screwdriver antenna, which is motorized and then that hooks up to your rig and you can adjust the frequency with that. So a lot of guys, uh, especially folks that have uh, uh, pickup trucks or larger vehicles, will use the, the uh, screwdriver. Um, last weekend I operated from my car at the hotel. I went to the Berryville Ham Fest and I brought my my little uh, KX2 which is a 10 watt radio and operated uh, sitting there in the parking lot and it happened to be a contest to the uh, NQ uh, National QSO Party, National Amateur Radio QSO Party and I sat there and uh, made some contact. All right, so here's my 10 watts going out over a very inefficient 40 meter antenna. <coughs> All right, so. For those who copy CW, well. so I put it in my laptop and enter it in the same same logging software we use for field day. All right, so so there's my 10 watts from a car. I didn't even hook it up to the battery. I just had a, the battery that was with the KX2 using that and stuck a mag mount on top of the car with my mobile antenna. 
All right, so if I can get back to the presentation here. Uh, just what do I do now? Well, you can just hit the X in the upper corner, but you're going to have to look at the screen because the map, just oh, think I'm of that at, as imagine that screen off the, off the right hand gotcha. side of your gotcha. regular screen. There you All go. All right. All right, so this was at the Berryville Ham Fest. Uh, <laughs> as you can see, there's um, a lot of antennas on that. Uh, pick, pick up. It's actually not even a pickup truck. It's a it looks like a Jeep. Jeep. Yeah. So I don't think that guy's married or he's divorced or whatever. But that's like a road sign. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Isn't it? I mean, so it's on a stop sign. so uh, you you can go to the extremes, like I said, with with something like this. And uh, this guy, they call them, I think, rovers when they have contests for going to, uh, like. Uh, when they're having a uh, uh, grid square con uh, contest, which uh, I've participated in sometimes. But there's the extreme, and I have a... Uh, I guess. Um, so now I'd like to talk about portable operating. And I ran across this publication that uh, ARRL puts out, and. Uh, it's by KB1HQS, and he's got a wealth of information in this, uh, in this book about how to operate and what kind of antennas are for backpacking and things like this. As you can see, this fellow's probably a, what they call soda, which they operate from different peaks, and he's got a full array of uh, equipment in there, including his antenna, which is attached to his backpack frame. So the book, the the, uh, the book has got all these different <coughs> categories here. You got, it's got how to carry your equipment and organize it. You can see he's got everything packed on that backpack. Uh, recommend recommendations for portable operating power sources, antennas, uh, how how propagation plays a part in your portable operating. Uh, what kind of on the air activities like the soda, uh, parks on the air was. That was last year or a year before. So they had guys, you know, traveling to all these different parks. Anybody know how many there were? Like 300? They're still doing it. They're still doing it. They're still doing it. Um, so, um, yeah, so there's all kinds of interesting things in this book. All right, so what I was going to show you was um, if you go to um, Amazon, this book is on Amazon, and you could. They've got a feature on there where you can uh, look at the first few pages. And there's a lot of cool stuff on just the first 10 or 20 pages. And that's what I was going to show you. So anybody who's remotely interested in portable operating, and by portable, we're talking about uh, taking it out of your car. Because mobile is mobile. And you, <clears throat> if you're going to operate in your car, you always sign with backslash or uh, Da, 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 M, or you just say mobile. If you're portable, you're, you're really outside your car and you're walking around or let's say you're visiting your uh, in-laws or whatever and you're in a different state, then you would say portable three or portable two, whatever. One of my pet peeves is during contests, people move and they don't change their call sign. So you think you, you know, you got let's say sweepstakes. So you need somebody from uh, Montana or something, and, or Idaho, and the guy comes back and, and uh, he gives a call that's from Idaho, uh, and you think, I, maybe this is the one, and the guy is in Virginia. Yeah, I, I changed my intention. All right. I'm my not, call was KL4CO from Alaska, that's why I changed my But anyway, yeah, so, <laughs> so you're a great example. But yeah, somebody yeah. would say, oh, I yeah, need the last for sweeps. I got, I got my clean sweep. Yeah, everybody did get the last. If someone's a W7, you might know he's just in one of five or six states. You won't know Montana. And with real-time logging, you know, with the online call book, you know instantaneously. How about KH? How about KH7? Kilo Hotel 7. So you, you enter his call sign, you hit backslash, you must log the pros, and it tells you where he's located. But I, I'm, not, I'm not there. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> <laughs> not to belabor the point. No, you don't have the not to belabor the point, but portable, generally you want to give your call as portable, whatever uh, 
uh, section that you're in. So if you're not in four land, you want to say portable three or whatever that you're in. But I highly recommend taking a look at this on Amazon. It's a great uh, book for uh, researching portable operation. All right, so here's my fun part. I love to travel, and I retired last year, as you might, might know, at 73, and I kept making a bucket list starting at age 70, because I thought, you know, I'm going to retire at 70, and then 71 came along, I didn't retire. So I kept adding all these things I wanted to do. Most of it was traveling, but uh, I like to operate when I travel. So one of the things that uh, you can do is operate in different countries without having to go through a lot of uh, paperwork because we have what we call a reciprocal license agreement with some of these places. And the ARRL has all this information up on, the, uh, on, their, uh, on their website. So generally, uh, there's two levels of reciprocity. One is uh, for guys that are extra and advanced classes, you can operate full privileges. In other words, all the uh, bands that are, everything that uh, come under your license. Then you have what you call limited reciprocal privileges for general class licenses, and uh, and that's that's that category. Um, there is unfortunately no reciprocal privilege for U.S. Te technician or novice license, with the exception, I think, Canada. It's just you can go back and forth to Canada and operate <coughs> as a technician or a, a novice there. So. So the, the, the one exception on Canada is that if you're an extra or a general and you don't know code, you uh, revert to technician uh, in uh, Canada. Well, all right. So, so you're going to go to a different country. So what do you bring with you? All right. So let's say uh, you, you're going to one of these countries that have their reciprocal agreement. So you want to bring a copy of that with you, pack it in your suitcase and, or with your radio equipment. You bring your original license, or, or just bring your license, uh, of course your passport, and this copy of the FCC public notice, which uh, is delineates, and I think it's German and French, as well as English, what the reciprocal privileges are. That's especially helpful when you're going through with wires and gel cell batteries and all this stuff that kind of looks suspicious. Uh, and people would say, if you see something, say something. Trust me, if you open up that suitcase full of all that stuff, that will ring a bell here. So having that paperwork. Um, so these are the countries currently that we can operate uh, without going through a lot of paperwork. And uh, I look at it as like a visa. You don't need a visa. You know, you just go there. So I went to uh, Finland, <clears throat> not to Finland, I went to Iceland and Germany and uh, I just brought the paperwork with me. Didn't have to worry about operating. So when I went to Iceland, I took uh, I took my uh, HT750, which uh, is a um, HF portable rig. And so this is this is what I took. Looks like an HT, doesn't it? So when you go through customs, if you have a lot of stuff, um, they might question it. But when I go travel with this thing, it looks like like a walkie-talkie, right? This operates on four, 40 meters, six meters, and um, and 15 meters sideband and CW. Okay, so I just speak into the mic, just like a just like your HTs. What's cool about it is takes double A batteries. Yeah. So you can, you can get batteries anywhere. And I just put a whip antenna on this thing. And if, if I can if I could work somebody, that's great. So that's what I took to Iceland. All right, so I was standing somewhere in, in uh, Iceland. <laughs> and near, actually, it was near Reykjavik, which is the capital. We were outside there. And I worked this guy in Finland which is about 1,500 miles away with this, with this little radio. Um, I also have worked on sideband, so it's, it's not impossible. 
uh, but as you know, when, when the bands open up, you could do sideband with just just a few watts. So this is not made anymore, but Ellencraft makes a KX2, which you could do essentially the same thing, and it's got a lot more features to it. But I just wanted to share with you this this thing is about 20, at least 20 years old now, but it still works. Um, so there I was in Iceland and able to work some ham radio without a lot of paperwork, okay? Um, so my, my big trip was two years ago when, um, when I was getting to, ready to retire and my son was getting ready to start med school. I thought, well, uh, nobody else wants to go with me. I'll see if he wants to go. And he's into photography and everything, so he thought, well, this, this would be a cool place to p photograph. But we went to, we had to go to um, Japan first because there's no direct flights from Dulles to Vietnam. I think you can go around the other way, Thailand or whatever. So we, I gave him the option of going to Japan or uh, China and uh, he picked Japan. So we spent about five days in Japan before we went to Vietnam. So Vietnam, this is the email I sent a couple of months before I left. I said, shoot, you know, I'm going to Vietnam. I got to operate over there. Big DX, right? How many people have worked Vietnam, by the way? Nobody? Okay. So it was good DX. You have, okay. So anyway, I sent this email. They have a website. They have a club station in Saigon, which is now called Ho Chi Minh City. And I sent this to the website, and I got this reply back. It says, can, can everybody read that? Okay, uh, I'll read it because uh, Joe's sitting there. Um, I advise you to contact XV2 Bravo or XV2A who will inform you how to pass the exam in Ho Chi Minh City. If you're fluent in Vietnamese, you can find the exam question banks online. They're inspired from the Australian exam questions. However, I think the exam should be done in English. So right away, I, that just turned me off, right? I said, screw it. So, so anyway, what did I do next? I contacted the guy that runs the club station. And he sent me an email back. He says, dear wr 4 with pleasure I received your email, dated whatever. Okay, you can operate on my shack after April 6th, 8th, whatever. Please tell me exact time in order that I can prepare something for you. Look forward to receiving your message. 73 is from Bok I, that was his name. So, the mystery, how do you operate DX without bringing a thing with you? Contact the club station in that country. Yeah. All right? And somebody will open up their house, hopefully, home to you. It's happened to be, the club station happened to be in his house. So that was pretty cool. So here were my son and I, Michael, getting ready to take off from Dulles Airport. And uh, of course, he's got just the backpack, and I've got all this crap with me. But anyway, so we, we took off. And this is, you know, in the back of the seat, you fly, they show you the map. So here we go from Dulles Airport all the way across and stopped in Tokyo, spent uh, five days in Japan, went to Hiroshima and uh, Kyoto, some other places there. Cool trains there, by the way. If you haven't been to Japan, really cool trains. And then I thought that Vietnam was just going to be a hop skip down here. Folks, it's a six hour flight from there. So all told, it's 20 hours flying, all right? But we broke it up going there because we stopped in Japan. Coming back, we did the whole 20 hours once. We had two hours layover to change planes in Japan. So it's not for the weak, all right? Unless you can fly first class, which is about 10 iPads. Um, <laughs> all right, so there I am in Ho Chi Minh City with XV2 Alpha. And his name is, ba by, uh, he's a retired school teacher. Uh, he was teaching engineering classes in, during the, right before the war, and after the war, he he uh, he does help he helps out with uh, ham radio stuff. <coughs> so if I wanted to actually get a ham radio license there, I would have to gone through all this exam stuff, which I said, BS, I ain't doing that stuff. Yeah, right? not and plus I don't think I would pass it. So anyway, we're we're at a station which is on the top floor of his home there in Saigon. And uh, so he let me operate. So here I am trying to work uh, a Chinese station.
he has a tri-beam or tri-beam on top of his roof and This was 15 meters, by the way. I think. 20 meters. Yeah, 20 meters. And he's got a 500 watt amplifier on top of that. So you, conditions were not that great. He, he did not have a Morse code key. Uh, uh, you were but since, but since, <laughs> since I was a guest there, I, I could not complain, right? I mean, he let me into his house. I had this terrible raging cold. His, his daughter brought me this tea that was uh, some kind of med medicinal tea because, you know, I mean, I was, and you can't find medicine in drugstores. Like, what's that stuff that stops your cold? Uh, no, uh, Tristan or something like that. You just don't walk into a drugstore and find that stuff. So I logged the contact for him, but I was not using my call sign, obviously. But still, it was for me, it was pretty cool to be able to operate. So this is how you could operate without carrying all your equipment someplace that you're going to travel to some country. You could even do that with, uh, you know, like our club here. Uh, I'm sure there'd be somebody open up their door to a, a foreigner to come in. <coughs> and uh, want to operate. I, I certainly would do that, and, and he did. All right, so let me stop this. So what do you think of getting out of Oh, well, I got lots of slides of that, but I'm trying to limit this to, ra to radio, and I've got 10 minutes left. <laughs> so if anybody wants to know uh, about the trip, it was really cool, really cool. And it was, our, it was sort of my son and I's last dad uh, dad son kind of trip because he's he's got a long haul he just started his third year of med school and then after that residency and probably get married and forget about forget about me I'll be dead by then I'm sure so anyway um, this was <laughs> yeah so, so um, this was a uh, when I read the guidebooks um, people said I can't see that. Um, why is that not working? Anyway, is that was a slide of the girl me, that met us with a car to take us to the to the place. We got in like at 11 o'clock. By the time you get through customs and fill it, the visa stuff, all that stuff, it was like 1 o'clock in the morning, and I just didn't feel like trusting Michael and myself to some God knows what kind of cab. So I, this thing was on a travel guide, whatever, a tra trip advisor as being very honest and they they also do tours of Vietnam too but all I used them for was just to get us from the airport to the hotel and it cost twice as much or probably three times as much as a regular taxi but they knew what they were doing and they got us there safe um, and, and yeah well Vietnam is a very safe place to visit I had we had no problems all right so my next trip was uh, back just two months ago I went to uh, Germany. Same thing with Germany. You don't need uh, license uh, exams and all that stuff. So I went to the Deutsches Museum there, and lo and behold, they had an amateur radio station, right? So the guy, I, I don't know if you can see the logbook there. So I signed the logbook, and he let me operate. And thankfully, I, I know I'm holding a microphone. But that's just, just that's just for show. Uh, there's a, you see it? <laughs> Morse code key. So I worked a fellow in, in, I worked a fellow in Belgium and a couple other guys uh, during my my brief visit at the radio, at the museum. But the Deutsches Museum is a, has anybody been to Munich? Great. Okay, I went to school there back in 60, 63. My dad was stationed in. Uh, Würzburg, Germany, and they had this 500 uh, kid campus of University of Maryland had at McGraw Concern. So I, that was on my bucket list. So I always wanted to go back and visit. So some friends and I that went to school there went back together and uh, 
one of the things I did was visit the station. So there's the ham that runs the station. They take turns operating uh, DJ9 Papa Echo, his name is Byrne. So this club actually maintains the radio station at the Dutch's Museum. So that's a selfie I took at the museum. And there's all the guys that are members of this club. And you can see, you can see Burned here in the background here. But all these folks take turns operating or manning the club station. Uh, and they only do it for like four hours a day. It's not, it's not like you know, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. They just, they're just there for four hours. I just hit it right. I just got in there. There were no tourists in there bothering him. So I took his time and I spent about 20 minutes operating and, and talking to him. And he spoke very good English, by the way. So these are all the guys at the club, all right? Um, and there's the sign. So you can imagine, I'm walking through the museum and I see amateur radio. Um, can somebody pronounce this in German? Amateur um, funk, okay. I look at this thing, I said, what the heck is this? So in that door, was my operating from, uh, from DJ land. Um, let's see, what do I want to do? You're using their, their call sign or your? I'm using their call sign. Okay. Why, their why, call why sign. Why couldn't you use yours? I, I could, but I, I, I could, but I wanted to, because it was the Georgia's Museum, that's sort of a dense state, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. so I, I didn't want to step on any Around there. But yes, I could have used Delta, I think you prefix it, Delta Julia WR4I. But I did that in Iceland. I used my call sign in Iceland and QSL the guy. So that was my operating in uh, Germany. So two places that I visited that uh, you did not have to go through paperwork uh, or I could just, actually I could have brought my rig there and I did bring a rig but I never got to operate because we were so busy. So that was pretty cool. All right, one of the neat things, and I know um, this was already presented at one of our meetings, but uh, there's, a play, there's a reverse beacon network that when you give your call, you call CQ, it has to be in Morse code, by the way. It doesn't make any difference if you go on five words a minute or 20 words a minute. Uh, so this was when the band was supposedly dead. You know, it's a way, place you'd look at sunspots activity. So I got on um, uh, Jim with the with my new Tentac Corsair that I bought last week at the Hamfest. So here are my spots. Okay, of the dead band. All right, 80 meters, three people heard me. 40 meters, nine people heard me. 30 meters, four spots. 20 meters, six spots. 17 meters, five spots. 15-3, actually 15-5, and then 10 meters, two spots. It said poor propagation, all right? So what does this tell you? Somebody's going to hear you somewhere, folks. So, well, somebody's going to hear you. So I think there's roughly maybe 200 of these beacons throughout the world. And, it, and if you're going to operate somewhere, uh, you, you know, you can say, well, gee, the band is dead. It ain't dead, all right? Now, I did operate, unfortunately, at QRO levels. I was operating because I wanted to, I was testing this rig, this old Omni I was testing. So it also gives you how loud they can pick you up. You, everybody understands de decibels, decibel levels? Okay. So that's relative to how many decibels I was heard on those different frequencies. And, um, and they, these, are the, these are the stations that picked me up. Now, these are all US stations, okay? Now, if I was in Europe and I brought a portable rig, I could do this and there are stations in Europe that would tell me if I'm getting it out, especially I want to know if, yes, Ed. Yeah, I think the reverse beacon network now does FTA spots. They have, they, they're experimenting, they're experimenting with that, yes. Yes, yes. Okay. All right, so this is one of the tools I recommend. All right, so some of the tips for ham traveling. Um, minimal equipment is a good thing. Unless you're in your car and you have an RV, you could just throw all your, your junk in there. AA batteries are better than large gel cells. 
So QRP <coughs> if possible. And this, this, is, this is why I like this radio, because throw in AA batteries. I could, you can buy AA's anywhere in the world and uh, not have to worry about it. Um, if you're traveling by plane, be aware what your antennas, wires, gel cell batteries, keyers, et cetera, look like to TSA checkers, okay? Some are more forgiving than others, but uh, the big thing now is that they do not allow lithium batteries in your check luggage. So uh, if you're carrying your radio, you carry it on board with the, if you have lithium batteries. Um, keep your expensive rigs and carry on, because this KX2 is, is over $1,000 with all the junk in it. Uh, you don't want to be entrusting that to check baggage. Um, you, you must have your hand license if you're going to other, other countries. So keep a copy of your license. Can you use just the card form or do you need the... No, you can use... The card. Yeah, in fact now the FCC doesn't send you a hard copy, right? You Did just print it out. Um, one of the things you could do is just bring your, bring your, everybody's got their cell phone and just load one of these apps on there so you can log uh, and then when you get home just dump it into your own log, logging database. So there's several of these logging programs for your phone or your tablet, whatever. Um, and then of course bookmark this reverse beacon network. So that's the end of my presentation. I have, did I meet it? 45 minutes? No, what about questions? Questions, okay. 60 seconds. All right, any questions please? How old were you in that picture? <laughs> I was pretty young. Actually, I got uh, more gray hair now, obviously, than that picture. Um, but I, obviously, I have a lot to tell you about these countries um, that I visited, but I try to narrow it to, to ham radio. So, what an excellent presentation. Thank you.